Virginians have always stood at the crossroads of the fight for freedom. It is a battle in which we all reap the benefits. World War II was the defining event of the 20th century. It involved 60 countries. Over 57 million people were killed. The nuclear age was launched, and the United States emerged as the world's most powerful nation. World War II was fought in two major theaters of operation, the North African, Mid-Eastern, and European theater, and to the Far East, the Asiatic Pacific theater. During World War II, thousands of ships were built for the war effort. Some of the most famous were built in the state of Virginia. This is the story of one of them. I first saw it in 1943, and I was amazed because <laughs> I was 17 and I right out of boot camp, and uh, I love the ship. First, love at first sight, you know, the beautiful ship. I was just amazed. I just couldn't um, fathom something being this huge out in the water, you know, and being able to not sink. It was in Newport News Shipbuilding Dry Dock Company uh, being fitted out. And so uh, after the ship was commissioned, that is, it was finished, and the crew was on board, most of our crew were raw recruits right out of Great Lakes. We took off from Newport News and out into the Atlantic to take a convoy over to Africa. And I guess I was just kind of overwhelmed. And then we were sent over to the Mediterranean to, to support the landings in Sicily, which was our first combat action. And we were bombarding positions on the shore. We got a message, and Patton's armored forces had out outrun their supply train. So the Birmingham put two or three whale boats over the side with 2,000 Spam sandwiches. Bougainville was the next big island that we had to take in this stepping stone effect that we had we were gonna use to go to, to Japan. I saw a formation of planes. General Quarters went. General Quarters, General Quarters, all hands man your battle station. It wasn't long until we are belly deep in jet planes. We could hear the guns, five inch guns firing, and then the 40 millimeter started and we knew something was getting close. And I heard through the headphone, I heard Sam yell, here comes a fish. We looked at each other and waited. Nobody broke, nobody panicked, nothing. We just waited. And suddenly there was a and the whole ship shuddered. And we looked around at the bulkheads and no water was coming in. So I thought, well, maybe we're all right. About five minutes later, another hit, torpedo hit. This one was aft. Just below the hangar deck. Well, out of that, we probably lost 20 people. And when we uh, took that aerial torpedo, it knocked the electric out right in there. We flipped on the ba them battle lamps, you know. We had a gunner's mate, and he says, ha ha, he says, I think we're sinking. <laughs> Scared me to death and all the rest of them in there too. No lights, no air in there. The ship could still steam, uh, still shoot, and we were able to stay in the battle. Those two torpedoes, the Guardian Angels arranged for them to go through that ship in the only two places you could put a torpedo in a Cleveland-class cruiser and not blow it up. 
We were amused later on to hear uh, Tokyo Rose announced that they had sunk to Birmingham. It was a cloudy day. Some plane came out of one of those clouds and dropped a bomb on the Princeton. And we were told after that to drop back and take care of the Princeton, see if you could put the fire out and get it underway again. I got topside and looked over at that Princeton. It was burning real good. And I could see the aft end there. It just looked like it's kind of red hot. So I sit down and underneath the number three turret. It wouldn't it be a hell of a thing if that boat would blow up. And the next thing I knew, I was on my face in the deck. <laughs> For the next seven and a half months, I didn't stand up. <laughs> I thought I was the only guy that survived back there in that after deck. I find out that there was one other fella that survived from back there. In his article, he said that there were 300 of them back there, and he only saw one living person. That was me. I thought I was all alone. <laughs> but I survived. We had one medical officer at the time. He said, I looked at you that first day, John, and I said, he's not gonna make it, so I leave him alone, try to save the people I can save. And uh, he said he came back about 24 hours later, looked again, he said, son of a gun, he's still alive. Maybe we can save you. Well, I was very lucky. I was up there watching the action as they were coming in. And for some reason, I don't know why, I said, uh, I think I'll go down below. Because we were not at general quarters. In fact, a lot of people up there were sightseers. So I went down the ladder, and I was not down there more than a minute or two till they exploded. And uh, there, were, there were bodies and pieces of bodies all over. And uh, blood running in the gutters. And, it was horrible. When the ex explosion, the the outburst from the explosion come, it, I was standing looking right straight at it along with another fellow. And of course, you, don't, you see it, but you don't have time to do anything. Uh, all that thrash and water hit me in the face, and I thought I'd been blinded. Got to checking around and see what was wrong. Had a sore mouth and a sore finger and a few things. I'd taken a piece of shrapnel in my, on my face right about here, knocked a shattered one tooth and one on my finger down here, plus numerous others. But when I looked out, pulled the curtain back, it seemed like it was a half hour, but it was probably over two or three minutes. What I saw was, I said, there was nothing wrong with me. I said that to myself, or I may have said it out loud. So I got up and got out of there. I said, I didn't need to be in here wasting their time because it was terrible when that exploded it knocked me down and i jumped up and i ran under the six inch guns because stuff was still falling but all of a sudden it started hurting and i lost all control of my arm we went it took us four days to get to a hospital ship and i was on there four days and the doctor kept saying did they x-ray you yet? I said, no, sir. The fourth day, he says, you come with me. And he took me up to the x-ray. He developed the x-ray, took me in the operating room. When I woke up, this was tied around my neck with a piece of gauze, the spark plug. It weighs three, a quarter of a pound, and it's pretty close to three and a half inches long. So put me in a hospital for nine months. And the, uh, the man on the right, his name was Staymates, he got killed. And the guy on my left, I asked about him, well, he got a black eye. And I got the spark plug. The whole side of the ship was like you take a shotgun and, and at close range hit a target. I mean, that, that whole side of the ship, big holes, little holes, everything. Everybody on the ship. Uh, on that side of the ship were immediately killed or injured. It's just like rain, only it was red hot metal. It just fell. It was shot in the air, it just fell all over the 
all over the ship. And the only thing I could think of was uh, going over the going over the side because I thought I was injured that bad in in my mind. As far as I was concerned, I wanted to be buried at sea. So I tried to crawl across the, the deck and that the metal, big pieces, little pieces there, were just, it was red hot. But I knew I had to get it under cover. So I crawled over under the cover there. My hands were all burnt and everything. And you know, the red hot metal. But I crawled over under there. And then uh, I guess I passed out. If it wouldn't have been called up, that I got called up because that one gun wasn't it, wasn't working, I wouldn't have been up on top side. I would have been downstairs by my bunk. But well, duty calls you go. The dead were stacked up in corners out of the way, and uh, about as I recall, 9:30, 10 o'clock at night, it was time to commit those dead to the deep. And uh, they went down to the lunchroom and got about 20 uh, lunch tables with collapsible legs. They laid them uh, open space on the deck not too far from the lifelines. There's about much space between each one. They sent out a... a working party to bring up a body, put on a table. And then when they got one on each table with a mattress cover over them, the chaplain would uh, raise his hand, say a short prayer. And then at each end, Four able-bodied men, with two on each side of a table, would reach down, pick it up, and go sideways to the rail and raise one end up. And a, a body would slide off into the deep. Did that for 220-some at night. Well, I think the first uh, thing was when I got noticed he'd been wounded. And then got checking around and checking with some of the other wives, you know. And uh, that's the way I found out that that was the incident. And uh, Perk said he was on the quarter deck. He and a couple of guys was watching somebody else, what they were doing. And those two guys just were blown to pieces. And he wondered all his life why he, why he was saved. At Okinawa was the next operation. And uh, this, we're now talking about April of 45. That was, in many respects, one of the toughest campaigns for the Navy. We lost more people in that operation than any other because of the kamikazes. We were standing out on the deck. I heard, I heard a plane, and I looked up, and here he was, right smack above us coming down. Get right in front of the bridge and went right down through the officers' quarters and through the sick bay and killed everybody. And the, the bomb went down to the armor deck and blew outside the ship. And uh, that's how it got flooded so bad. That's when I looked up and saw the suicide plane. He was just straight down. He went for the bridge and missed the bridge by about five feet and hit main deck on the starboard side. We lost 49 men that day. and. Uh, uh, four were missing and 89 were wounded. There was a Marine uh, and he was on a 20 millimeter gun and he was shooting and he was knocking 
chunks out of the wing of that plane, big as daylight. It was just scattered holes in it, you know. So I ran down the passageway, pulled the watertight door shut behind me. Well, the plane hit just a few feet the other side of that door. Came, I couldn't see it, of course, but it, but it came straight down. And uh, about 50, 50 some were killed, and most of them were in sick bay. I was covered from the mess hall for some reason, but I don't remember why, and I was headed for my bunk, which is in the first division. And that's where the bomb went off. It's in the first division. So I thank the dear Lord many a times that I didn't make it to my bunk, because <laughs> I wouldn't be here today. And our whole area was engulfed in, in flame. And my instinctive reaction took over, and I dashed out of there through the burning part of the ship. My roommate didn't get out, and that haunts me to this day. We buried 27 out at sea on the way to Guam. You know how they do that. They, they slip them off, and the taps. You know, that's, that, that's, that's when, the, when the real reality hit me then. You know, because I didn't want to go back out. I was, I was very apprehensive. And, uh, and you know, shucks, I'm only on this thing for a short period of time, and I can imagine what these guys have been on that thing since it, it was commissioned. You know, what they've been through, and then going back out and getting smacked again. The ship was commissioned in 43. It was hit in 43, 44, and 45, and decommissioned in 46. And uh, it was quite a gallant ship. Almost unlucky, but then again, it was a great ship. And I had a lot of old memories on that ship. They were wonderful people. And they were very exciting, dramatic things to live through, but being part of that enormous fleet. I knew that never would there'd never be a fleet like that again in history. So I felt that I was a part of history and I was damn glad that I survived it. I made it. A lot of them didn't. It was rough. We helped uh save our liberty, preserve our liberty. I still think it's the best thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs>